Welcome to Real Estate Investing Abundance, the show for busy, fulfilled professionals like you to learn how to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alan Lomax. Hello, enlightened investors. Happy to be back with you again today. I'm your host, Dr. Allen. I know you'll enjoy today's show, and I have a big ask that will only take a moment of your time. Ratings and reviews are the lifeblood of our podcast. To leave a review and a rating, iPhone or other Apple iOS device users, go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes. For all you non-Apple device users, go to podchasers.com. On either site, search for Real Estate Investing Abundance. Once you find us, leave both a review and a rating. Subscriptions are also vital to the show's success, so please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. It's free to subscribe, and you can unsubscribe at any time. Enlightened investors, happy to be back with you today. I'm your host, Dr. Allen. If this is your first time tuning in, I know you'll find great value in the show. Are you perhaps a busy professional passionate about the work of your calling, but have come to realize that the hope of developing financial independence has taken a backseat to priorities of following your passion? If you can identify with this, I've got good news. Steed Talker Capital is an investment company designed for passionate, fulfilled professionals like you to help you develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. We have created an enlightened investor circle just for you. Go to our website today and enroll in the enlightened investor circle. There you'll receive education and support for the passive real estate investing goals no matter your level of investment experience and expertise. Enlightened investors, today we will explore with our guest how you can become empowered to build real wealth through real estate investing. Our guest drew on a successful career as a management consultant and startup owner to develop a firm that has over 1.4 billion in affordable workforce housing assets under management. Having attained financial freedom through real estate investing, he now helps others to do the same through his podcast, Ritter on Real Estate, monthly networking, meetups, and his website. Welcome our guest, Kent Ritter. Kent, before we delve into the secrets of attaining financial freedom, share a memorable experience from your formative years that helped you to be the person you are today. Sure, Alan. And and first of all, thank you for having me on the show. Excited to be here today. And yeah, man, something from my formative years, probably the thing that impacted me me the most what was a fairly traumatic event when I when I was a child. I, I lost my father when I was 14 years old. Uh, it was a car accident. So so it happened very unexpectedly. I was an only child. And so, you know, really in that situation, you you become, you know, de facto man of the house, right? And so obviously it had a huge impact on me. I think some of the ways that it has impacted me is just my independence, kind of ability to, I, th- I think, take charge to I don't know, step up to the occasion, if you could say that, uh, because of just the, the necessity and need to, and just the the ability to kind of manage the responsibilities. And also, I think just a, a level of gratitude and, and appreciation for every day, for, for every moment, because you just you really don't know when it can be your last, it can happen in a blink of an eye. I think that has to be number one. You had mentioned you were able to step up to the plate and actually become the man of the house. What were some of the activities and things that actually entailed? Oh, gosh. Well, I think just things like, you know, help, helping out more, right? And, you know, playing a bigger role in, in, in keeping up the house and household, you know, doing more chores, you know, th- things like that. Having to be a part of pretty big financial decisions at you know, at a young age, uh, I mean, definitely had guidance to, through my mom I and mean, my, my mom is wonderful and, and uncles and things, but, you know, as, as things were kind of being left to me and, you know, having to, to make decisions on those. And yeah, I mean, I think those are, those are some of the things that, that I would think about. Well, thank you for sharing that. Let's go on into the real estate business here. And you make an effort to ensure that there is a positive impact from the work that you do in multifamily investing. Talk to us about what it is that you do, how do you do it, and how does it make a positive impact? 
Sure. So what I do and what my firm Virgin Held does is we acquire uh, and improve workforce housing. So what I mean by workforce housing is usually B, C class apartment buildings with folks that, that typically have, have an average income of probably forty to you know sixty thousand dollars a year. You know, largely renters by necessity. You know, not by choice. Folks that will be will be renters for life in, in many circumstances. And so the way that that we create a positive impact is is because we're creating clean, modern and affordable housing for, for this demographic, for, for America's workforce. Right. And, and I think there's just, there's, there's a lack of that. And, and I think it's something important, you know, for everybody to have just a clean, safe place to live. So when you say 40 to 60, you're talking about family income, not individual. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Household income. Household income. So you're going into these properties, C-class and B-class properties, and I suspect you are purchasing them in generally somewhat distressed condition. Is this correct? Or No, not distressed. Distressed, I, I would classify as not making money, you know, lo- losing money, low occupancy. No, the communities that we're acquiring are, we would describe as a value add real estate strategy, meaning we're buying properties that are already cash flowing. I mean, we buy cash flow positive properties, really improve them to, to help them make more money, you know, to, mm-hmm. to provide the returns for our investors. So we're, we're syndicating these deals, meaning we're bringing in money from private investors. We're pulling our money together. Mm-hmm. My partners and I invest anywhere from 10, minimum of 10, but upwards of 30, 35% of the equity in each deal. So we're right there alongside the investors, pulling our money together to buy something bigger and better than we'd be able to individually. And in doing that, buying the business, buying something that's already producing cash flow, helping it make more cash flow. So, you know, our investors are seeing cash flow right off the bat from their investment. But these properties, while while not totally neglected, uh, still have things to improve, you know, whether it's just modernizing the units, you know, new appliances, new washer dryers, things like that, adding additional amenities. Something that we're doing on almost all of our properties is is adding fiber optic internet to the properties and trying to create win-wins for our investors and for the residents is really what it's all about. And I think the fiber internet's a great example of that, where we're able to come in and become the internet service provider for the property. And in doing that, we will charge typically anywhere from, you know, 10 to 10 to $15 below the market, you know, whether you know, it's a Comcast or a Spectrum or, or whoever is the, the main provider for better service because it's fiber optic, steady, high speed, always consistent, really high upload speeds, which you don't get over cable internet, which is really important for folks that are doing video conferencing, like Zoom calls like we're on now, the upload speed really matters. So we're able to give a better product at a cheaper price. That's how it helps the resident. How it helps our investors is we become the internet service provider. And so we are shifting. I mean, the resident was already paying for internet. We're just shifting who they're paying. They start to pay us. They're paying overall less, but but to us, it's it's maybe it's a net increase to our other income. And we're able to create a nice in- income stream for the property while not adding to the financial burden of the resident. And actually reducing the financial burden for many of your residents, it sounds to me like. That's right. So how do you go about becoming an internet service provider? We partner with a couple of companies that provide the service. And then what we do is we will pay essentially for the capital expense to get the physical lines to the property, right? And then wire the property. And then the partners that we work with provide the service. And yeah, and it's become a, a nice partnership. Right. So it's kind of, you know, they get it, they kind of get it to to the property. We pay to get it from, you know, the pole to the building and wire the building. And then from there we're able to we're able to provide you know, the internet service. And in doing that, I mean, it's, we're, we're wiring the properties with, you know, the wireless routers and modems are already in there. So when somebody moves in, the other benefit is they don't have to worry about calling the cable company. They move in and we flip a switch and they have internet. Wow. That is definitely impressive there. What approximately is the upfront cost per unit to add the fiber optics? Yes. Approximately twelve to $1,500 a unit. Okay. And so you're redeeming that probably in pretty close to a year, year and a half. Is that right? Redeeming your costs? Yeah. 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 In probably, yeah, it's about a two-year return. 
about a two-year return. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, but you have to think. So think about it this way, though. If we're we're financing the capital outlay, so you know the returns are actually much greater than that because we're not out. We're not putting any capital out at the beginning. So Sorry. we're 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 financing the uh, the capex expense, mm-hmm. and then able to to get the revenue. Mm-hmm. So so really, I mean, the returns become, uh, become quite infinite. large. Yeah, for infinite. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to say infinite, but yeah, potentially infinite. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. As an industry-leading relationship-focused design-build construction firm, Mosaic Construction has worked in many different asset classes from multifamily to retail, medical, industrial, and commercial. Mosaic Construction works to execute interior and exterior renovations with their team of trades and project managers. Their experience with value-add improvements has resulted in increased ROI and long-term value of the assets. They work nationally in partnership with local trades to deliver thoughtful, problem-solving construction management solutions to all their clients. For a personal no-obligation consultation, call Ira Singer, 773-491-3145, or email Ira at mosaicconstruction.net. You can also find Ira on LinkedIn. Wow, that is an interesting concept. Do you know if this is this an option that really is available nationwide, or is this something kind of unique to your particular region? You know, I, I think it's available nationwide. So we operate in ten states, and it, it's available in all those states. And you know, I would assume it's something that's available nationwide. I think what's unique to us is we've actually gone down the path to seek out these providers and build this partnership and come up with a model. Uh, an operating model, right? Where, where we work together in a partnership and, you know, understand who's paying for what and who's laying out capital and when and where to get this done. So I think that's really the secret sauce is creating the partnership in this program and then being able to implement it at scale. And that's what I think has been a, a huge differentiator for us. Yeah, you know, partnerships are so vital to success in real estate. I'm wondering, was there somebody on your management team who actually had internet service provider experience, or did you all just go out and research this and educate yourselves on this? You know, there were some relationships that existed that you know we were able to tap into and kind of flesh out further and and make sure that the partnership made sense. But no, there, there's nobody in particular that had a specific you know that worked for Comcast or Spectrum or somebody. Talk to us a little bit here about actually achieving financial freedom through alternative investments. And uh, particularly, if we can, let's focus upon that passive investment aspect. Sure. So the path that I advocate for and and that I facilitate is investing in, in multifamily properties, right? And so we bring in, as I said, you know, investors to invest alongside with us as we buy as we buy the properties and improve the properties. It's typically a, a three to five year hold period. And in that time, we're, we're giving cash flow back to the investors from the operating income of the property. And then we're sharing in the appreciation at the time of sale. And the other benefit is that we're actually passing the, the tax savings from the depreciation on the property back through the investor as well. So oftentimes the gains are completely tax sheltered while we own the property. And and if folks are investing in other real estate as well, that depreciation could be used to offset other investments potentially. So your investors are actually getting all five of the ideal aspects of investing in real estate, the income, the depreciation, equity, appreciation, and the leverage aspect of that. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So you mentioned leverage. That's one of the great things about real estate, right? Is, is the ability to leverage your investment and, and create better returns, right? You you really can't do that in a meaningful way in the stock market. You said equity. Well, yeah, equity as far as, yeah, I mean, you're an owner in the property, you know, just like I am and just like we are. We're all owners property and therefore you're getting your share of the profits and the cash flow. You're getting your depreciation and then, yeah, the, the appreciation at the sale and we're, we're sharing in all of those. I have not found, I mean, I started as a passive investor. I've invested in many different types of deals, office, industrial, different aspects of residential, you know, single families, quite a bit, quite a few things, you know, on the debt side, doing private lending and, uh, and buying note portfolios and things. I have not found a better risk adjusted return than multifamily. And that's why I really dedicated my life to doing that now. That's why I'm actively sponsoring those deals and bringing those deals to my investor base. 
space because I really think they are. It is the best way to get your, you know, the best return. When you think about it on a risk adjusted basis, and when I think about risk adjusted, I think about the likelihood that that return I'm being promised actually occurs, right? You can, you can definitely get much higher returns doing angel investing in startups, right? But the likelihood that you will is much lower, mm-hmm. right? You may, I mean, you may hit a 10 X deal out of the park, but you may have 10 others where you lose all your money. Right. But on the, these deals that we're doing, because we're not buying distressed deals, we're buying deals that are already cash flowing. I look at it as we're buying businesses that have existed for 20, 30, 40 years, you know, and have done well. They, they, they're, they've got positive cash flow, but we see opportunity where, where we can do better, whether, whether the property is mismanaged and we can manage it better through our property management firm, whether it's undercapitalized, meaning the, the owner just didn't have the money to, to maintain the property at the level it needed to, whether it's creative things we can do, like adding, adding fiber internet, right. And create value. We're looking for situations where we can create value and increase the, the NOI on the property, the, the net operating income and, and pass that through to our investors. Well, I totally agree with you. I think in terms of risk adjustment, multifamily is one of the best risk adjusted investments that you can find there. But it also has all of those other advantages, the income uh, depreciation for tax purposes and equity appreciation and leverage and many of those other investments you were talking about, uh, private debt notes and so on and so forth. They don't have all five of those uh, wealth building capacities to them. That's not to say that they might they might be right for certain individuals, but they don't have they just don't have all five of those elements. Yeah, I'll I'll tell you a quick story of when I I first started real estate investing. The first thing I did was was sell houses on contract and you know and hold the note. And um, that was because a family friend was was doing that strategy, and so I you know got on there. And about a year into that, you know, one of those houses sold. And because I was, I was holding the debt, I got the HUD statement. I looked at the HUD statement and the house had doubled in value. And I was just getting my, my loan paid off, which is great. You know, I'm getting my money back and and I got some interest all the time, but I'm like, wow, this guy, this guy doubled the value of the house in a year. And, you know, he's doing much better. I said, man, I want to get off the debt and I want to start buying assets. And that really set me down the path to, Uh, owning assets and focusing on equity. That is an excellent example. And it truly illustrates that huge difference between uh, debt income and owning those properties, because I mean, there's just so many advantages to going in and actually owning the properties. What you had talked about the fiber optics, and that certainly is uh, one technology. Are there other examples of technologies that you are putting to work to help essentially the bottom line of the investment operation? Yeah, that's a good question. So we are very focused on, on staying at the forefront of, of what I would call you know, prop tech, this property technology. And through really 2020, you know, we really put a, a solid focus on it, really used that, that time at the, the second half of 2020 to really look at the landscape and understand the environment and the players and the different technologies out there. And went through this fact finding process, formed a uh, technology committee and really are, are starting to now implement these strategies. And so, so some of the things that we're doing are the first use case that we really set out to solve is, is how do you, how do you create a contactless leasing process that's more efficient and more accessible to the prospects where they can come and they can view properties on their own time, but, but still as effective as having a leasing agent there with them in person. Right. And so what we've done is we've, we're installing smart locks on our properties, which allow us to, to control access to the property remotely, right. From an app. And that that's great for management efficiencies, but, but it's also great from, it's kind of the, the front door of allowing, you know, literally and metaphorically the front door of allowing the, these prospects to come in. And then we're layering d- different softwares on top of that. Uh, one is called Tour 24, which is a self-guided tour product, which I'm, I'm really excited about. We've seen great, just seen a lot of success already from marrying these products together. And what it does is it actually creates a, it's a self-guided tour. What that means is that the person can come and tour the apartment and the property without, without having a leasing agent. They're really guided through, through their phone to an app on their phone. So the person, you know, goes online, they make an appointment to come tour. 
and they download the app. And then when they show up for their scheduled appointment, they're sent a code that is a one-time access code that allows them into the property or into the unit and wherever they need to go. And then they're actually, there's, there's a curated tour that occurs through the app, whereas the there's geolocation beacons in the property. So the app knows where the person is in the property. Wow. And, and as they walk to, for example, the pool, the app knows they're at the pool. And so it pops up and says, well, welcome to the pool. Here's all the information about the pool. And the cool thing is, is it's actually, you know, you think about it as like, it's, you want your best leasing agent giving their best tour on their best day. And you want that every time. Right. So that's how we went through this is who's, who are our best leasing agents? Well, what are the things that they, that really resonate with people when they talk about the property? We got that down. That's been professionally voice recorded. And so when someone's at the pool, it's actually speaking back to them and telling them about it and telling them or at the fitness center or, you know, in general about the neighborhood and all these things are captured in this curated tour. Um, and it, it's a really powerful, it's a really powerful program. And, you know, COVID obviously has proved additional benefits of being able to, to come in and feel safe and tour without having to physically, you know, be face to face with someone, right? It's also allowed us to expand our leasing hours. You know, many properties now, we allow folks to come and tour all the way up to eight o'clock at night versus just having to rely on a property manager or leasing agent's schedule, right? Or when the office is open. And, and so we've just seen we've seen great benefits. And I think that's just the tip of the iceberg, but that's, that's the first use case that we've really gone through and, and, and solved and are, are implementing throughout the portfolio now and seeing success. And, and that's paired with virtual leasing. So it's like they go through and they tour, they can sign up for a lease then right at the spot you know, and be ready to go. So they do that on their cell phone, I'm assuming. Yeah. They sign yeah. the lease right there on their cell yeah, phone. Yeah. Just doc, yeah, DocuSign through their cell phone. Okay. It's all facilitated through and- the different softwares that we have. And deposit is automatically taken directly from their credit card, bank account, whatever is that's also, I'm assuming, automated. Yeah. So they, yeah, they set up the source for their deposit and, okay. and then we take the deposit. Yep. Yeah. It's all able to be done electronically. Uh, and I am also assuming that they probably at that same point in time, they're setting up their monthly payments to be drawn on that same account. Is that true? Uh, yeah. They can do all of that online through their account and their profile. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Would you ever invest all your money in a single stock? Very unlikely. Yet investors are willing to risk $50,000 to $100,000 in a single property in real estate all the time. Avestor is the world's first customizable real estate investment platform. Investors can build their own custom portfolio selecting investments across multiple asset classes such as single family homes, multifamily, student housing, self-storage, and shopping centers. You can also invest across multiple markets and different time frames. Avestra also enables other real estate entrepreneurs and syndicators to build and use Avestra's infrastructure and cloud platform to create their own customizable real estate funds. To learn more, visit us at avestrainc.com. Avestra, real estate investing made simple. Well, that is truly impressive. The fiber optics is off the wall, impressive, and the contactless uh, leasing along with that amazing uh, tour. Any other technologies as if that wasn't quite enough there? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there's a lot that we're exploring right now. You know, we're, we're kind of doing our, our diligence. We've got a few pilots going on. AI chatbot is one thing. You know, we're piloting that at a couple properties. You know, it, it is technology, but it also involves people, but but just centralizing into a call center. So we're, we're piloting that as well on, on several properties on, you know, using a call center approach instead of having the phones go to each individual office, having, having them go to a centralized call center and being able to manage that inbound communication, whether it's email, whether it's phone call, whether it's maintenance requests, manage all that through a call center. So we're, we're piloting that on several properties and we've seen great results. And so it's something that likely we'll be rolling out and expanding to the whole portfolio. Impressive. Tremendous amounts of infrastructure investment there. You talk about the advantages of buying smaller properties. I'm thinking it might be rather challenging to implement 
at least some of these technologies on smaller properties, particularly if you're a small investor with just one or two small properties. Would you say that is the case or does the debt, I'm sure you're doing this through debt cap X, is it feasible for small properties to get involved in this level of technology? So I, I think it's critical for small properties to be involved in this level of technology because the only way that you can manage smaller properties efficiently is by leveraging technology. And that was actually the catalyst for, well, a catalyst. And also we use some of our smaller properties as kind of a proving ground right? To develop pilots. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. As pilots. So I I think it's critical and these things are all, none of these are are that cost prohibitive. I mean, a smart lock is $200, you know, and then you just have to pay, you pay the different softwares and things, but none of them are that cost prohibitive. And there's, there's cheaper solutions out there as well than what we're using. I mean, we, we really went for a best of breed approach when I talk about the different softwares we use that there's other options. So if you're, if you're someone that, you know, manages a portfolio of single family homes, then like smart locks will change your life. I mean, if you're driving around town trying to let people in and to do all these tours and they, I mean, that, that would be uh, terrible for me. That's why I don't own a portfolio of single families. That's why I, I like all my people in one place in an apartment building. But um, you know, I think it's, I think it's critical. And so financing, you mentioned uh, debt CapEx. I mean, we, we raise, all of our CapEx. So when we're raising equity, we, we raise not just to purchase the property, but we also raise up front for all of the uh, improvements that need to be done on the property. So we make sure we have that money earmarked and ready to go, whether we're buying a small property or, or a large property. So then we're able sure. to, to very efficiently go in and implement the business plan without having to worry about you know the sources of where the capital is coming from. Sure. Well, two hundred dollars for a smart lock. Well, you're going to pay anywhere from a hundred to two hundred dollars for just a regular lock these days. So that truly makes sense. What about the per unit cost for the two or twenty-four and the AI chat box? What are those coming out to per unit? Uh, let me think. I don't know if I know the exact per unit price of each one, but I, I will caveat it with the fact that we have fifteen thousand units. You know, we we have a considerable scale, and and we get preferred pricing because of that scale. And and also, we've uh, we've negotiated because I, I lead a lot of these negotiations negotiations, I will say very aggressively with our vendor partners. And so our pricing is not necessarily the same pricing that that others would be able to achieve. But any of these things are, are you know, a few dollars a unit a month. Mm-hmm. And their cost savings. I mean, the less demand on your management team, I mean, a huge reduction on their time mm-hmm. and effort and energy which is going to be, I mean, being that uh, your property management costs are some of your most expensive costs, that's going to be really, I would consider it to be a a significant savings that is adding directly to your bottom line there. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, we're, we're being conservative about it. We, we, we are not directly underwriting revenue increases or, or specific cost savings due to technology at this point, because it just hasn't been proven out enough yet on our portfolio. You know, we're six months into a lot of these implementations. Uh, so the deals stand on their own. The technology is kind of gravy at this point, helping make them better. But one thing that that you mentioned earlier is just the, um, you know, the, the need to have a, a positive social impact. And, and I think like, I think that I, so I just, I wrote an article uh, that was recently published in, in Forbes and it was called how um, prop tech is making multifamily better essentially. And it talking about this idea that I think that through technology, I think ultimately the goal should be to, to have a more humanistic approach where we are taking, you know, taking property managers who may be, or maintenance folks who may be spending all day rekeying locks, right? And letting them focus on, on their highest and, and best use and purpose, right? Helping them focus on what I mean by a more humanistic approach is by spending that time, you know, with the residents, understanding the residents' needs, uh, creating programs to, to meet their needs, creating a sense of community, you know, versus the, these mundane things that can be automated through technology. And I, I think that as, as multifamily has been kind of a slow adopter of technology, I think as we continue to see this adoption, that I think uh, ultimately it improves the lives of, of all of our residents. I would agree. It certainly does sound like a, not just a, a huge advance for your side of the coin as owners and managers, but I can see how 
this would be really advantageous to those seeking to rent. I mean, being able to go and view an apartment at eight o'clock in the evening when that fits your work schedule and your family schedule, rather than having to come between nine and five, that's mm -hmm. a huge advantage in and of itself. And having fiber optics, who doesn't need that these days? That's something that we don't see a whole lot of except in A-class properties. So I am really thrilled to see that this is coming to, uh, to workforce housing and what a, what a gift you're giving to, uh, to your communities by being able to do that. Oh, thanks, Alan. I appreciate that. Well, talk to us a little bit here about the most effective ways to raise capital. Sure. The most effective way is, is to always be, be raising capital, but not thinking about it as, as you're just out to raise capital, right? I, I really think about it in a, in a way, kind of like a, a trusted advisor, if you will, where my, my job and the reason I do my podcast and I go on other podcasts is to educate people about the values of multifamily real estate. Like you said, those five items that are creating value, right? Before 2015, I didn't know that any of this existed. And I fancied myself a fairly sophisticated investor, but I didn't know that you could go out and pull your money together and, and invest in these large apartment buildings. I assumed that apartments were all owned by these large corporations, not groups of individuals. And, you know, and just really fell in love with the investment for all the benefits we talked about. I mean, it's, it's radically changed my life just from a return, I mean, from a return standpoint, but also from just a time freedom standpoint, right? With the passive income and the extra wealth it's created and the offsetting of taxes and, and everything else. So really just wanting to start by just educating folks. Right. And coming from a place of, of education and, and trying to build trust with them so that they so that they will listen to what I have to say, which which I think is in their best interest. And, and, and that's the most effective way way to capital raise. And, and I think the way so you've got to approach it from a place of of kind of, you know, that's oriented toward the investor, right? What's in it for them and explain what's in it for them. You've got to take the time. You got to start by listening. You got to start your conversations. Like most people are surprised. Like my first conversations I have with investors, I hardly talk. You know, I think a lot of people take the approach to, that they want to get on the phone and, and they want to they want to tell the person all about the stuff they're doing and their deals and 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 how smart they are about multifamily, right? And and why you should invest with me. I like to start with just understanding them and, and understanding their goals. And, and oftentimes you'll find that people may not really have clarity there. And so then it's about asking good questions to help people clarify their own thinking so that they can make informed decisions. And I, and I think if you do that, then ultimately they, they see all the benefits without you having to really jam it down their throat. You know, it's, it's approach. I, I think it's how you do it. It's how often you do it, which is consistency, right? I mean, you have to be consistent. You have to be present. That's why we do the podcasts. It's why I'm on social media every day. That's why I have a blog. You know, it's these different things because you have to be present. You have to stay top of mind because people have to have a familiarity with you. They have to, they have to trust you. They have to be familiar with you. They have to think that you're you're credible, right? So, the, so there is an element of credibility, but the credibility comes. You know, the, the, you're not getting credible by by just vomiting all the stuff you know at them, right? It's it's it all happens over time. So that's the most effective way is to always be always be networking and always be always be accessible to folks, but but do it from from a place that that's I think really a service mentality and, and an education mentality. And and if you do that you'll be successful. Enlightened investors will be right back after this important announcement. I have a big ask that will only take a moment of your time. Ratings and reviews are the lifeblood of our podcast. So to leave a review, iPhone or other Apple iOS device users, go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes. For all you non-Apple device users, go to podchasers.com. On either platform, search for Real Estate Investing Abundance. Once found, please leave a review and a rating. Subscriptions are also vital to our show's success. So please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. It is free to subscribe and you can unsubscribe at any time. Well, very good suggestions, Kent, and not just on how to raise money, but I think actually how to be a real and genuine uh, person. And you have yeah. certainly <laughs> done some amazing things in the last uh, five, six years, uh, made some amazing progress there. And a very 
interesting time we've had together. Before we go into our last segment here, you've got、uh, some things for our viewers and listeners that they can benefit from. Share with them what you've got for them. Thanks, Alan. So, if folks go to my website, kentritter.com, just my name, you can sign up for, for our newsletter. And, and in doing that, what I'll, what I'll give to you to, to try to add some value to your life is the, the top four things that you should be looking for in a syndicator. So, so the person that's going to be sponsoring your investment, right? And, and how I came up with those four is on my own podcast, Ritter on Real Estate. I always ask the question, you know, what, what's the one question that an investor should ask their deal sponsor? And, and through 40 or so episodes, I, I've, I've kind of aggregated those together and, and taken the, the top answers and, and created this, this, this little one pager for folks to kind of talk through each, each of the top four things you need to be looking for and, and explaining what they are. And, and I hope it's just a simple tool for folks as they're out vetting sponsors because it starts with the sponsor. It doesn't start with the deal. You can't invest in a deal until you know the sponsor. So you got to vet the sponsor first. Because a, a, a good sponsor can, can save a bad deal and a bad sponsor can kill a good deal. So it all starts there. So as you're looking and networking and finding sponsors, just four things to think about that, that I hope will help you avoid some pitfalls.、Um, because I had a situation where, where I invested with a sponsor and, and he, he did some things he wasn't supposed to do. He committed some fraud and, and, and I lost my investment. And so I don't want anybody else, I don't want that to happen to anybody else. And so, so the first thing on my list, I, I won't. Share all four so you guys can go check it out. But, but number one is character and, and talking a little bit about, about how you understand that. I totally and completely agree. Many passive real estate investors are concerned about the property that they are going to be investing in. And that's not a bad thing, but that's really not the first thing. The first thing they need、mm-hmm. to be doing their due diligence on is certainly the syndicator、uh, themselves. And character, I totally agree with you. That is really number one. It's a difficult thing to determine if you don't take the time to actually know that person.、Mm-hmm. Uh, they could have a tremendous online presence and be a horrible person. So you really <laughs> need it. Yeah. You、I really- mean, and that's where I went wrong, right? What was I didn't do the homework up front to really get to know the person. I didn't even speak with the sponsor before,、uh, before investing. And, and that's something I would not recommend to anyone. I think you're absolutely right. You're going to have to take some time to get to know who it is you're investing with. These are private investments, they're not public. And it behooves you to know who it is that you're investing with. Excellent advice, Kent. Let's go into our last segment here. And would you share with us one of your most difficult setbacks and how did you come through that time? And what did you learn from that experience? Before getting into real estate, when I was a management consultant and I went out and、uh, I was kind of testing other options,、uh, if you will. And, and there was a job that came up that I thought was、uh, really interesting, kind of a lot, a lot of money being, being put, in, put in front of me, potentially, you know, you know, to go do this. It's kind of a career switch and all these things. Well, I, you know, I went and, and did the interviews, spent the day with the company, thought, thought I really killed it. And then I ended up not, get, not getting the job. And it was, a, it was a really a big surprise to me. The only feedback that they gave me was that I talked about real estate too much, And, which to me, I, I didn't even really think I talked about that much. I thought it was more like at lunch, we were chit chatting, kind of thing. Like, what else do you do? And it's like, oh, well, you know, I invest in real estate at that point. You know, I, I had done one syndication, you know, but it was still a side thing. And so I saw that as a major. Setback, but in reality, you know, you kind of shut a door, open a window, right? Because what it made me really think about was wow, if If, it, if my passion for real estate is coming through that strong, then I really need to trust myself and I really, I really need to, to jump into this. And so that really set me off on, on pursuing real estate full time. And I haven't looked back. I, I'm so happy that I did. Sounds like a serendipitous、uh, setback. So, what in your life do you feel most grateful for? My family. My family is, is why I do what I do. I mean, that was the reason, one of the major reasons why, why I wanted to leave management consulting is because as a management consultant, you're, you're traveling constantly. And I had this after we had my first child, I have three now, but after we had my first child, you know, I was, I was getting on the plane to early in the morning to Monday morning to fly out somewhere. And, 
I had this vision of like my, my kid in the future and people would be like, Oh, what, you know, what do you think of your dad? And they're like, well, you know, my, my dad was gone a lot when I was a kid and it was kind of gut, gut wrenching. It's not what I wanted. I knew that in that career, I wasn't going to be able to be the, the husband and the father that I wanted to be because you just, I just wasn't going to be able to be present. And so that was another huge catalyst on what set me out to pursue financial freedom and real estate became the best, the best vehicle that I could find to achieve that. Well, how are you putting your success as a real estate investor and entrepreneur to work to create universal well-being and abundance of all beings? You did share with us some of the things you're doing within your housing, fiber optics, and other technologies and different ways of building community within your business there. But are there other things that you're doing to help create well-being and abundance? Yeah, I mean... I think so. So I think that we talked a lot from like the resident perspective and, you know, and there's even more that we're doing from that perspective of trying to just create communities. But from an investor perspective, I mean, I mean, I, I view it, I, I view really what I'm doing now as a mission to help people see alternatives and better investment options uh, to educate people that these exist, to help them get over their limiting beliefs and their own barriers. Uh, Cause everybody knows somebody that had a bad real estate experience, right? Like everybody knows somebody was a landlord and, and it didn't go well. And, and, and they kind of like, Oh no, real estate's not for me. So a lot of the conversations that I find myself having are helping people understand like, you know, how it's different. It's different. You're investing passively. You're investing with a professional. We have an infrastructure around us that's Set up for success, right? We're not one guy trying to manage manage a, uh, a single family. So, I think by doing that, by educating people, hopefully, I'm helping helping these people, you know, just make more money, just build wealth to be able to pursue whatever it is they want to do. Whether it's pay for their kids' college, whether it's retire in comfort with actually income streams versus just having a pile of money you built up in your 401k that you hope you're going to die before it runs out, right? Or whether it's leaving your W-2 because you don't like it and you're unsatisfied and, uh, and you want to spend more time with your kids like I did. So I think that, you know, that in, in some ways is altruistic in that just trying to evangelize for this and, and help people know that these, these investments are available. Well, Kent, our last question is imagine that you have come to the end of your life as you lay on your deathbed. What do you look back on with a sense of satisfaction and uh, fulfillment? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that, I think that's a way a good way to kind of look at any decision in your life, right? Is are you going to be happy with it laying on your on your deathbed? And for for me, the the things that I think really matter are, you know, was I a good husband? Was I a good father? Did I really savor the, those moments? You know, the, those moments with with my kids and with my family. And then hopefully, did did I have a <clears throat> just a positive impact on people? Did I leave the world a little bit better than? Uh, than when I came into it. And I think if I can achieve those things, then it'll be a well-lived life. Well, some huge aspirations, and I certainly wish you well in attaining them and achieving them. Thank you so much, Kent, for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. It's definitely you know, getting a little deep and a little bit of different questions. So I appreciate your originality there and, uh, and happy to explore that a little bit. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing Abundance, brought to you by Steve Talker Capital, a company working for passionate professionals like you to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steve Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steve Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures, great and small, flourish abundantly. For resources to develop your financial independence, connect with us at stevetalker.com.